I am I'm thrilled to be here. It's been a long road uh, to get here, and so I'm going to tell you just a little bit about that, uh, a little bit about the one area where I'm the uh, dominant world expert, which is on me. And so <laughs> we started off, uh, I'm from Albuquerque, New Mexico, not so far away. And that's relevant because my very first job um, was at the time when the government decided that it was really bad to blow up bombs in Nevada and to test them and started this huge ambitious project. Could we just simulate the bombs and not actually blow them up? And that was a completely crazy idea in the late 70s, but it actually worked really well. And so I got to play on a Cray supercomputer, which is really dating myself, but that was very exciting for a 15-year-old in Albuquerque. When I got to Harvard, uh, the first thing I had to do was declare a major, and all the science professors were recruiting for their departments. And so I got up to this table. Uh, there's a legend, I didn't know it at the time, Steve Harrison, sitting behind the table, was one of the people who first started crystallizing proteins to figure out how they fold. And he says, what are you? What? And I said, I'm a computer scientist. And he said the following words to me in 1981, when I barely understood it. He said, the future of the life sciences is computational. Imagine what that was like to hear that in 1981. And I thought, this guy must be right. And he, he, he said, we'll create a major for you where you promise me to take one wet lab class and then everything else can be any science that you want. And I thought that was a good deal and it was very fortunate because I never got a single one of my electrophoresis experiments to, to work. Right? So it was terrible, terrible, terrible in the lab, but really good at, at writing software and building models and gathering data that was experimental and verifying it with the models and then going on from there. Now, I also had the privilege of working on crystallizing the tomato bushy stunt virus. You will never forget a name like that, tomato bushy stunt virus. And this was in the Harrison lab. And, and Steve, even back then, said, I am sure that if we know the amino acid sequence of a protein, and if we could just get the math and the software right, we could figure out how the protein would fold. This was in 1981. It took many, many, many years to figure this out, and you've all heard of AlphaFold, and I'm going to come back to AlphaFold because it's really, really incredibly important. Now, I then developed a fascination for artificial intelligence. I did a PhD in medical information sciences, but really AI, uh, way back then, uh, when we were embarrassed to say the words artificial intelligence because we could only handle really almost trivial toy problems. The combinatorics were so incredible. So I had, again, serendipitously, the chance to work with three other guys. So one of them is me. One of them is the chief science officer of Microsoft. One of them is Amazon's distinguished scientist in machine learning. And the fourth is by far the most successful. I shared a cubicle with him, and he thought, early on, medicine's too hard. Computers are not going to get there. Way too slow. They will get there, and he would tell me, but it's going to take another 30 years. I don't have time for that. So I'm going to use AI to solve a much simpler problem that people care about deeply, which is what movie to watch tonight. So that was my buddy Reed Hastings. He went off and started Netflix. And so the uh, rest of us labored in obscurity for a long time. We felt really sorry for a bunch of people who were working on this thing called neural networks. I remember we would say, like, like that's going to work, right? And so we were completely wrong about that, been wrong about too many things and right about a tiny number of things. And so we kind of ignored them. And I really got lucky. In 1993, out of the blue, I got a letter from a headhunter, and it said, I've been instructed to look for entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley with PhDs in computer science from Stanford and ship them over to Goldman Sachs. And I thought it was a joke, and I was very poor, and so I went on a lark, and I figured I'd scam this bank for a free trip, 
and, and, uh, and, and then they put an offer in front of me, and I thought, okay, I'll work for a year and pay off my debts, and I stayed for 26 and ended up doing a bunch of things. So I had this very odd career path. Um, people in Wall Street simply thought it was weird that I had gone to medical school. They couldn't make any sense of that. The PhD, that kind of made sense in the group that I was in, uh, but it all seemed like a detour to me, and I spent most of my life thinking that I had wasted some time in that MD-PhD program at Stanford, and I should have gone straight to Wall Street. It didn't start to make sense until, really, I met Josh Wolf, who introduced me to Zavendar, you're gonna meet later, who introduced me to Chris Gibson. And Josh and Zav just said, we want to work with you on a company, and this company called Recursion is the one. And I learned a little bit about Recursion. So why am I so excited about Recursion? On the long list of things I'm doing, why is Recursion up there with my main gig, which is I, I'm at Sixth Street Partners, and my other little gig, which is that tech company that Tina mentioned, Alphabet. Um, why recursion? And the reason is, I figured out, like many of us, a long time ago, you can have really cool algorithms in machine learning, but if you don't have the data, it just doesn't matter. And so the thing that got me excited about recursion when I was talking to Chris, he would tell me about the robots cultivating human cell lines and then systematically perturbing them in every possible way and gathering vast amounts of data and cleaning it and curating it and making sure that all the experiments are repeatable, reproducible, making sure the data is relatable. This is the sort of thing, you know, it may seem like a geeky concept, it is so important and you can have the best algorithms in the world, but if you cannot train it on reliable data, it doesn't matter. I'm in a bunch of interest, industry com, uh, conversations where everybody agrees that we need a, an immense data set of perturbation biology. I'm not gonna jump the gun, you're gonna hear a lot about that later in the day, and I am so excited about it. Why does this matter immensely? Let's go back to the protein folding example. Over 50 years, a bunch of grad students like me laboriously crystallized proteins. They documented their work in a standard file format. They con committed it to the protein data bank, which started in maybe 1971. AlphaFold is a magnificent piece of work. Without the protein data bank, it would not exist and you would never have heard of it. There was the data standards, the protein data bank, there were competitions where there would be new proteins and then people would see whose models best predicted the structure of those proteins before they were inserted into the protein data bank. So about the time DeepMind, Demis Sasavis got to it, there were about 75,000 sequences and these had been hand crystallized, every one of them, and laboriously curated. The miracle of AlphaFold was, it's amazing, training on those 75,000 proteins. Then once the model got to a sufficient level of rigor, guessing the structure of 350,000 other proteins that were not in the protein data bank. This could have gone horribly wrong, right? The model could have trained itself and wandered into the weeds. But instead, it went incredibly right. Rapidly after that, put in the sequence, predicted the sequences for a million proteins. And then not very long ago, AlphaFold inserted into a new data bank predictions for 200 million proteins, which as far as we know, is every protein that exists in any life form on the planet. And now we're going to town on that. And while that is wonderful, and that is a miracle. And I remember people saying, chess, go, easy stuff compared to protein folding. But now protein folding is a solved problem. That is amazing. 
But the problem that we really want to solve is a much, much harder problem. And that problem is I have a patient who's got some symptoms. And what I really want is for one of those Star Trek synthesizers to synthesize a medicine that I give to the patient and then the patient is well again. Like that's the dream. We are far away from that. That's the bad news. But here's the incredibly exciting news. I wanted to convey to you that I am an old timer in AI. I've been around it for a long time. I've been through multiple nuclear winters. In the last 18 months, there is a miracle unfolding and not enough people are paying attention to it. And the miracle is that whatever the AIs can do three months ago, now it's twice as good. And that has been happening for a while. So now we'll get to something else. You've all heard the proverb about the chessboard. The Shah wanted to reward the inventor of chess for creating this magnificent game. And the inventor said one grain of rice on the first square, two on the second, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024. The computer scientists and all the powers of two. And it's not very exciting. Now look at drug assets that are being discovered. One, two, three. It looks pretty slow. It almost looks linear. There's nothing interesting about it. But then you start getting to the second half of the chessboard, and round about 40, you start to get to millions. And of course, by the time you get to the last square on the chessboard, there's more grains of rice than atoms in the universe. And that's the thing that's very hard for human beings to comprehend. Our brains just are not built for any kind of exponential compounding. And certainly not for the one that's been happening in AI for a long time. I think we've been doubling for a long time. It's just that the many, many doublings we've had have not been all that interesting. But now I can tell you from recursion, from every other place, um, in the conversations, the second half of the chessboard has arrived. And so while this problem of discovering the right drugs is immense, to put it in perspective, given compounds, small molecules of a certain size, there's, let's call it, 10,000 trillion of them. 10,000 trillion. And right now, there's 4,000 approved medicines across the whole planet. 10,000 trillion to 4,000. That sounds daunting. And as I said, we're a long way from the solution. And we can't do this chat GPT style. The other day I was playing with chat GPT. It is amazing. I put something in, and remember I'm a computer geek, and it blithely responded, Python, unfortunately, lacks an addition operator. It just said that. I'm like, this makes my brain explode. I know I can type two plus two into Python, right? So it makes stuff up that isn't true. And while that's cute on a chat bot, it is not cute when it comes to medicines, right? And so that's the thing that grounds us in reality here at Recursion. And what is happening here at Recursion is part of that miracle, that exponential compounding. We are in the second half of the chessboard and Unlike some of those chatbots, it is tethered to the most important reality I know, which is making people better. And so that's why I'm here, and we're gonna tell you a little bit about it today. <laughs>